Go Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Andy. I'm from Finding Value Finance. Uh, I'll be your host today. Uh, we've got Simon Michaud with us today uh, to talk about this uh, grand energy transition. Uh, so thank you for coming on, Simon. Really appreciate it. Uh, taking the time. Hi, Andy. No, nice to meet you, mate. Yep. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, so first, I'll just start off, uh, establish kind of the, the background. So tell me a little bit about your background and the research you've performed uh, in terms of energy transition. Right. So uh, my basic, uh, I'm, a, I'm an associate professor of the Geological Survey of Finland and the area I'm, I'm working four fronts. We'll come back to that in a moment. My basic qualifications were a uh, basic degree in physics and geology, applied science, double major, uh, then a bit of mining geology and open pit optimization. Then I did a PhD in um, uh, mining engineering in explosives. Then for eight years, I was in geometallurgy, which is a combination of geology and mineral processing. In that time, I was looking at the energy of communution, the crushing and grinding of rock, the energy consumption that's about half the cost of mining. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so you think I left the academic group after 18 years, the University of Queensland, Julius Crutchnip Mineral Research Centre. And then I went to work for a private um, company called Osenko, which was an engineering procurement and construction management co company. And so I actually got to see the private side uh, of, of how the industry worked. And during that, I learned how the capital investment side of things, like their, their view of the world. The mining industry crashed in 2012. I went to Belgium and I learned industrial recycling and uh, the circular economy for the first time. So it was a couple of years of that. And then I moved to Finland to do mineral intelligence. And then I uh, moved to a different part of GTK to join the Circular Economy Solutions KTR. And so we're reinventing the circular economy. So my four fronts are geometallurgy, digitizing our process plant up at uh, um, uh, Orokumpo, um, Reinventing the Circular Economy and Mineral Intelligence, which now the work that you're referring to is over the last five years, I've been examining what it takes to phase out fossil fuels. So if we were to completely phase out fossil fuels to, to replace the existing system using the calendar year of 2018, what would that look like? So all cars and trucks are now EVs or hydrogen fuel cells. All power generation is now renewable in some form, nuclear, hydro, wind, uh, solar uh, geothermal biomass title and then I worked out well how many units are we talking about that to, to replace that to ma maintain an existing system and then I worked out the amount of metal we needed and then compared that metal up against reserves and resources and that's where we've at uh, the conclusion I came to is our existing plan has not been thought through right and we don't we, we simply don't have the we don't we, we don't have the um, minerals in in the ground, and recycling can't deliver the metals we need either, because the metals that we're after are relatively exotic. Like we do use cobalt and lithium now, but but in really small volumes, right? So what what now we've got as a as a situation of um, that the volumes of metals we need of these exotic metals is so large that they don't actually exist above ground at the moment in large enough quantities because so this is a mining story so then comparing it up against the mining industry the, the problem is the demand is so large uh yeah anyway so, so there's a few things to unpack there there is one or two controversial points which can be debated over uh the big one is the signs of the power buffer needed for wind and solar right and and so how big is that now the work i've looked at is pumped hydro cannot be expanded to meet that demand and stored hydrogen can't do it either. So what that means is we have to fall back on battery banks, which is what the governments around the world believe they think they're gonna do anyway. If we can't meet that power demand, the wind and solar is not viable in its current form. So now we're back to, is it a mineral shortage or is it a technology inappropriateness? One or the two. And so we actually need something fundamentally new to sort of come out of this. And that there are supply, that there are innovation vectors there but we've got to do them you can't just ignore them 
anyway, so that's that's a long winded introduction. Okay, so let's describe the current state maybe problem that we've got. So you said that we don't have enough minerals in the ground to satisfy the demand that's potentially coming, or is it we don't have enough minerals that are basically we've got projects coming ahead of us to satisfy it? Is it minerals in the ground in total, or is it the projects that we have in the pipeline that can't support it? It's actually both, right? So, so the production numbers to actually hit the target where like we've got a 100 transition which is what the iea believes is going to happen by 2050 that's 27 years away so it's not such a long time really uh the amount of copper we need for example will need something like 250 years of production at current rates now that uh, we're not to fit 250 years into 27 years so on so on one hand existing production and all existing demand is nowhere near enough to deliver this extra demand, then you could say, well, what if we had a forced march approach where we were aggressively starting new mines, mines and resources? So it takes 20 years to, you know, 15, 20 years to start a mine once you know where the deposit is, right? So we can't just throw a switch and have it all turned on next week. But even if we did, what we call a reserve, a mineral reserve, something that's been attached to, say, a feasibility study, um, is less than 5% of what we actually need for some of these minerals like lithium or cobalt. So we've got a massive shortfall. So then you go, so what if we had a time machine and we expanded everything out and said, what if we went after all resources and turned all resources into mineral reserves, Just which by the way is impossible. A, a resource is a mineralized patch of ground that's higher than natural background mineralization. So if you were to actually go out and uh, a, a lot of those resources are not extractable by current technology. Uh, like they're too deep or they're too low grade or the grains, the mineral grains is, is, is too fine, right? So it's, it's not as simple as that, but let's say it was, even those resources are not enough. And even if you added the resources that we know of under the sea, which we shouldn't do, but that's another conversation. But even if we did, that's still not enough. And that's just to replace what we have now to stand still. Then you've got the idea of economic growth, population increasing and the uh, our current economic model is based on growth. So that's the way it is in 2018. Go forward to say 2100, and we want to double and triple the size of our human enterprise. It's, it's, it's not not going to work. We, we need to go back to the drawing board and actually sort of come at this from a different direction. When So when you went back and you looked at all these different minerals that are required, where... What are some minerals that stood out where the pressure is really big uh, in terms of deficits or shortages? Where are those minerals uh, in the system where the pressure mounts first, second, <clears throat> third, uh, and so on? So the first pressure point is actually not minerals, but it's our ability to smelt and refine those minerals into something useful. So the industrial capacity, most of it's in Southeast Asia, China in particular. But as large as that industrial capacity is, most of it, uh, it, it's still not, nowhere near large enough to deliver such a large volume quickly enough. So that's actually the first bottleneck. So th then we come to, well, the minerals we need. All the battery minerals that we looked at, uh, that, that I looked at, sorry, so with lithium, cobalt, graphite, and vanadium, uh, you know, th th they're just some fairly simple ones. They were all, the amount of metal needed to replace our existing system was something like, three or two or three percent uh, uh the metals in the ground sorry in terms of reserves were two or three percent of what we needed so it was a massive shortfall now you could just say well we'll just make batteries out of something else uh, now that is true but there's a a resistance in the industry to consider that and i'm still seeing that now so um make batteries out of fluoride for example the fluoride in your toothpaste or or zinc or you know, you, you know, um, or sodium. Now, there's lots of options there that don't have resource constraints, but you've got to go out and develop the, the value chain to do it. Right. So, let's say we make batteries out of something else. Every system I've looked at needs copper, and it needs nickel. Nickel and copper are in the shortfall category, uh, and so there are supply shortfalls in the industry now, in existing demand. Uh, 
coppers now, um, a lot of the mines in, say, South America, for example, they're quite low grade. And you, to raise capital to start a new mine is really tough now. It's really tough. And so there's less appetite for that. So, so bringing on new operations has been really hard. And it takes time to do so because they're so large. And so the copper industry at the moment is facing shortfalls and 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 difficulties now, never mind any extra demand. And the extra demand is so enormous, it blows everything else out of the water. So so the the pressure points you see first in minerals are all the battery minerals, but you can very quickly get off those battery minerals, go to something else. We're not going to be able to replace copper or nickel very easily. Right. So uh that that is going to be or graphite for that matter you know most anodes are made out of graphite right so 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 th this is the nature of the problem and then we've got to go back to well, what are we really trying to do here so we're trying to actually sort of substitute all ICE vehicles for an electric vehicle should we consider doing something else and people will then come back and say well obviously we're going to shrink our system but the people who control our society aren't thinking that at all they're really not. You know, the people who control, say, the hedge funds, the banking hedge fund system, they're thinking in terms of economic growth. Uh, all the civil senior civil servants that I've actually sort of um, talked to in multiple governments now, uh, they said, well, of course we're going to grow. Why would we not grow? Leave us alone. You're an idiot. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they really sort of don't get it, what they're facing. Uh, and, and so... Yeah, so so the human consciousness, both individually and as a group, is both the problem and the solution. We can't get out of our own way, but once we do, we might be able to sort of start looking at solution vectors. Yeah, and I, and I know a lot of these minerals, they are meant for electric vehicles and renewables. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the question that I have is next, uh, do renewables even work i mean the solar okay. and wind uh, are they even viable alternatives in your opinion so all of these systems work when they're on a small scale and when they've got an external support system in some form when you're actually going to make them large scale and you've got to make them self-sufficient or internally stable somehow that's when the trouble starts um wind and solar are supposed to be the uh primary energy source according to the IEA going forward knock out all fossil fuels and we're going wind and solar like 70 percent of the energy mix is now wind and solar is what is the perceived plan the problem is both wind and solar are so in so variable so amazingly variable uh, uh, solar for example on average across the planet was operating 11.4 percent of the time so 11.4% of the calendar year in 2018, it was actually producing electricity. Right. And so wind was 24.9. And I think wind, um, the engineering can get it up to 33% now. So that's, that's, okay, most of the time these assets are idle. And that's, you know, that's the weather. You can't do anything about that. Uh, so our power systems depend on clean sinusoidal power. Coming out of the wall, same current, same same voltage, same frequency, and a very, very narrow efficiency peak. Otherwise, we get what's called a brownout or a power spike, and that'll cook most computers. Right. So we can't have variability. We have to have a buffer. So the question is how long? The short-term variability of that buffer in the literature is five to seven hours. Now, that looks at the difference between the day-to-day -day supply and demand balancing. And it does not look at, for example, the long-term variation of, say, the seasons. The difference between winter and summer uh, um, or wind in particular is highly variable and you have these massive peaks followed by like a couple of days of lull uh, um, and so th th these are real problems if we can't resolve that the wind and solar are not viable right so is do renewables work what well, depends on what you mean by work they can generate electricity but it, can they do it in a in a form that's actually useful for our existing society, or does no, more work need to be done somehow? Uh, then you've got the idea of, uh, well, how much effort do we put in to put up these systems? How long do they last? And how much electricity do we get back? How much power do we get back? And the best performer is nuclear. And the poorest performer, performer is things like uh, biofuels. 
right? But, but, and and you've, you've, you've got a ranking. And, and, and so this is the concept of energy return and energy invested. I didn't use that in my calculations because it is such a vague term and there's no agreement what should go into the calculation to make sure you're comparing apples with apples. But in, in, in general terms, oil is the most calorifically dense energy source hum humanity has ever seen. Um, and we've built our system based around that. Peak oil could have been November 2018 crude oil that is what we use oil for is now being drawn from uh, um, uh, biofuels and and parts of the natural gas industry and so the concept of peak oil is now evolving into something else but there's trouble in paradise the heavy stuff that makes for example diesel and bunker fuel um, and, and things like asphalt that's in trouble so the, uh, the best analyst I've seen in on this topic is Art Berman and Labyrinth Consulting. So I, I recommend you find him and and, and interview him. So um, yeah, do renewables work? Um, in some circumstances, yes. In the circumstances we need, not yet. Now, then you've got the things like a society will organize itself around an energy system, whatever that is, right? So it, it will um, allow, um, like for example, we, we, we we used to move everything around on a steam train with a coal-fired steam train. So everything revolved around the idea of the rail network. So then we discovered oil and invented the internal combustion engine. And now we can move things around in a four-wheeled vehicle, like a carriage without a horse, which was much more convenient. And as it was more convenient, society evolved around that convenience. So now we're going to sort of, we want to replace it with the either a hydrogen fuel cell or an electric vehicle both of which have different requirements to keep them going. For an electric vehicle, you need charging stations. <clears throat> now, when you go into a, a petrol station, uh, like a fuel station, you fuel up, you, you're there for about 10 minutes and you're on your way. When you pull into an electric vehicle charging station at the moment, you're there for several hours waiting for your cars to charge up. And while that is happening, you're tying up a charger and there's a queue of cars behind you. So society has to change itself around about how we're doing the charging. We don't know how to do that yet because we're still thinking in terms of it's just the same as, you know, petroleum um, products. Then we've got the problem of, of hydrogen. Hydrogen works great once you've got it, but you, it's, it's a carrier. You've got to produce it, right? And if you're not using natural gas, you, you've got to use electrolysis. So and the uh, once... So to so to to produce one kilogram of hydrogen, you need about it's between fifty and fifty five kilowatt hours of of electrical power to to, to use that. But then you spend two point five kilowatt hours to compress it and put it in a tank. So I use the number fifty two point five to be on the conservative side. Once you've got that kilogram of hydrogen in your tank and you put it through your fuel cell, you're going to get fifteen kilowatts back. So fifty in, fifteen out. So you've got a twenty eight percent round trip um now okay we're paying for a service the ability to drive a car so you've got that difference in efficiency which means the runtime of the vehicles involved like a petroleum driven vehicle compared to a hydrogen driven vehicle will be different and so we, a society will have to adjust for that then you've got the idea of how do we actually produce such a large amount of hydrogen store it and transport it because the, the, the problem with hydrogen it's a very small molecule and it gets through most materials and it makes pipes brittle and then you start having flammable gas leaking so, so, so like yeah so flammable gas leaking and so you've got the, the capacity for an industrial accident it's quite it, it is very different to what we have now just as an electric vehicle with a lithium-ion battery every now and then one of them catches fire and when they do it's such a problem to manage that fire. It can take days to manage a single um, electric vehicle that's actually sort of catches fire and starts burning. And we've got these electric buses with these massive batteries along the ceiling. When one of those catch fire, that's going to be a problem because they burn so hot. And often, you know, if you have, if if it happens to go up when buses are parked next to each other, then one bus can set fire to all the other buses. And so, so. so I'm not saying we're not going to do these things. What I am saying is we now have uh, an issue where um, 
the risk profile and the logistics profile to use these technologies different to what we have now and society doesn't know how to use them yet because we haven't done it yet and we're going to have to learn by doing uh but in principle from what i've seen so far all of these systems while they work they're just not as effective they don't last as long they don't go as far um uh, you, you, you've got your performance metrics of speed. That's now starting to happen, okay? But how long do they last? And then how long does it take to refuel? Them? And then where do we get the fuel from? The infrastructure associated with that is, at the moment, is dependent on fossil fuels. So, so you've got a, a long-winded uh, way of saying, do renewables work? The answer is not yet, in my opinion. Not yeah, yet. And what about the imp? the infrastructure that's needed for all this stuff. I mean, I know you brought it up there. Um, do we yeah. have a massive kind of barrier to entry to adopt this stuff uh, with the infrastructure of it? Because I mean, all the solutions that I heard there were outside of maybe hydrogen uh, is all electrical based. Uh, can our grid even come anywhere close to supporting the load that potentially could come? I don't believe so because when I was in Australia, the, the, the electrical grid uh less on finland but in australia we don't do maintenance right we do the bare minimum possible to keep that grid going and and so every time a storm comes through the grid ages and because it's an above ground grid it, it gets knocked around in finland they actually do their maintenance very well much better than any other country I, i've sort of seen and a lot of their power infrastructure is below ground so once it's maintained it tends to stay maintained for longer but most countries I've been to, they're optimized for the existing system. Like in, in Australia, for example, if um, it gets hot, everyone's got an air conditioner out. So everyone turns their air conditioner on at the same time. And then the power grid will crash and no one's got any power. And so it's stinking hot and no air conditioning. <laughs> but, but that tells me um, the amount of electrical power we're talking about is substantially more. It's not just a bit more. It's it, it the grid may have to be twice the size it is now, and so that's not an efficiency gap there. Uh, we, we need substantial infrastructure to be constructed to do it. So most of the solutions I've seen do use electricity in somehow, but they're going to deliver the electricity through different vectors. Like even hydrogen, you're putting the hydrogen through a PEM cell to create electricity, and then drive an electric propulsion motor. So it's it's not a direct combustion fuel uh yeah so it's it's just not we, we just haven't thought thought through the practicalities of these things like we, we do what i was expecting when i arrived in europe because europe was so so far ahead of everyone else in, in this topic come on surely they've done this i was expecting to see a feasibility study in the macro scale ref industrial reform to phase out fossil fuels and i was expecting to see even a conceptual study it doesn't even have to be pre fees but conceptual. Like number of power stations, what kind of power stations, where are they going to be? Um, then you get to the point where who's going to own them, who's going to operate them, who's going to pay for them. But then what infrastructure goes between them? None of that was there. And and so the world at large, and this was, I saw this back in 2015, and it still hasn't yeah. changed, is we are now looking at um a world that is actually done we've done all our planning for the future based on ideology and normally that's fine usually what happens is ideology it's a belief system great but you hand it over to someone to do the math okay this is what we want to do tell us if it's going to work and should we change the plan if it's not going to work they didn't do that step and they still haven't done that step and and now we've got a thing where um as as a belief as an ideology for the last hundred years or however long we have the belief that all natural resources are infinite that and it's an economic thing throw enough money in it and resources can be found right uh this is magical thinking right it, it's, it's especially like, like oh, oh the price will go up we'll just extract it out of seawater <laughs> so okay you know the, the the one of the arguments i often hear there's so much lithium around as lithium is in seawater that's not a problem Yes, there's lithium in seawater, but as such trace elements, the amount of effort you've got to go through to, to extract a single ton of lithium, how much seawater do you have to process to get that one ton? And how much energy would you consume in doing that? 
it's uh, the, then the logistics of that operation will sort of you know, sink it. Yeah, so no, no, there's no easy answers to these questions, but we must solve these problems somehow. Yeah, and another thing that I that I you know looked at, researched a little bit, um, and you and you brought it up earlier in this is that <clears throat> a lot of the deposits they're a lot lower ore grades, a lot deeper, a lot more difficult to get. Yeah. Um, and I, and when I look at adopting a new potential system, uh, what are the barriers to adopting that system? Uh, if all the minerals are harder and harder to get exponentially, uh, if we have to expend more energy to get those minerals out of the ground, uh, and we're using some of these reserves with very low ore grades, where's that energy going to come from? I mean, isn't the minerals that we want just a derivative of energy? And yes. isn't our energy consumption going to, I'll say, geometric, you know, almost geometrically increase uh, in a nonlinear rate to try to get all these minerals at low ore grades out? Uh, isn't that Simple another barrier yes. to adopt this new system? Simple answer, yes, um, unless we think of a different way of doing all this. Most of the mining I've seen in my professional career has been based around the idea of fossil fuels. But no, most mining technology underground, for example, is electric, but that electricity is generated generally from a gas power plant, from a gas pipeline, or sometimes coal. We are not using solar panels and wind turbines to mine copper. Right. So th then you've got the truck and shovel fleet. Big mines like Escondida in, in South America, the cost of mining, uh, the, the, about between one quarter and one third of the total cost of, of mining is to get the ore from the pit floor up to the plant because these pits are so large, you know, you know a kilometer deep. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. And so that's a lot of driving. Uh, they use, you know, these, these big haul trucks to do it. And then they've got things like, um, to um, electric motors on the wheels, but that electric motor is powered by an electric generator powered by diesel. So to run it, you fill up a diesel tank and away it goes. Diesel's still the primary fuel for it. Now, now they've got the idea that they can actually sort of make an electric truck based on batteries. And at least over a short stretch, they can actually go as fast as a diesel fuel truck. But no one will tell me how long they last. Because a, a mine... Uh, a mine shift is like 12 hours and you'll have these haul trucks so they're continuously going and the economics of the mine is based around the equipment and how long you can continue to run that equipment uh and so and and then once the, the battery of these massive trucks wears out how long does it take to recharge so now that, so does that mean you've now got a large proportion of trucks that have to stand down and charge while other trucks are running so you've got like a massive proportion of your fleet idle and then that kills the economics of the mine. So th these are the numbers we've, we've, we've got to get off fossil fuel somehow because oil's in trouble, right? So, but I'm not convinced we're going in the right direction yet. When you say oil's in trouble, what, what exactly are you referring to? Are you referring okay. to the, the overall volumes? Is it the energy returns on oil where, uh, you're expending a lot more energy to get that oil out of the ground. You have less for society to use. W what do you mean oil is in trouble? Can you just dig okay. a little bit into that? All of the above. All of the above. So 120 years ago, when they first discovered oil, you know, you dug a relatively small hole in the ground and it would spurt up into the air under pressure and you'd catch it in a bucket. And it was such high quality that you could almost put it straight in your car or on your salad and eat it. Right, it was very, very high quality, and there was a lot of it. So, for the last century, we've chewed through all of those really high-grade deposits. Now we've got the very, very poor quality deposits left. You know, things like tar sands in Canada, or how deep, uh, like you've got to go out to uh, um, deep water. You know, sea that's you know three and four kilometers deep, or ten, however deep, and then you've got to drill into the crust really really deep many 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 kilometers and then you've got to get it up and once you get the oil up it, there, there's more processing steps which is full of sulfur and sodium right so all right so more effort has to go in to get the oil and get products to the market but we've used technology to actually increase economies of scale against that sliding scale of quality around 2005 
uh, we had a peak in a peak in conventional produced oil. Uh, what saved the day was an innovation in horizontal drilling, which allowed the fracking industry to be viable. Precision horizontal drilling with fracking became the new source of oil. And from about 2008 onwards, that became the new expansion. Most expansion of oil has actually happened in the tight oil sector. Since 2005, there was a, a conventional oil did go up in, in volume. I think it peaked in 2011 and, and now it's uh, gone down. But since 2011, all new oil expansion has come from tight oil, which is by definition very, very poor quality. So we had a localized peak in 2018 in November. Um, but there's been innovations on, on how to make things like gasoline and jet fuel from biofuels and excuse me, natural gas liquids from refinery gains. Right. So so we are forcing an inefficiency into the oil market that didn't exist before. What I'm saying there is we've got an enormous amount of oil left. Lots and lots of oil is still left. We're not running out of oil. What we have run out of is cheap oil. And we can't actually sort of produce the volumes we need to expand. Our system wants to expand and grow. But to do that, we need lots and lots of energy cheaply delivered and quickly. And we can't do that now, cheaply or quickly, or in the volumes we want. So now we're in a, in a, in a, in a system where... Um, it's getting harder and harder to expand. And now we actually might have to start contracting in terms of what volumes of stuff we're bringing to the market. And the, the types of fuel we're bringing to the market are also changing. So oil now has to work harder and harder and harder to deliver what we've always taken for granted. Meanwhile, our economics thinks life is grand and we've got to expand in size. And so for the last five years, like, like there was a study done by HSBC Bank um, in 2015, 2016, sorry. Uh, at the time, 81% of all oil deposits were declining at a rate of five to 7% a year. Now that's that's now what, seven or eight years ago now, right? And that is a cumulative problem. And so in the background, all those conventional oil systems are, are declining and our ability to bring new stuff online is getting harder and harder to do because the fracking systems require a lot of upfront capital. Now we're back to we've run out of money. <laughs> so it, it, if, if you're not putting the upfront capital into doing more drilling, then you're not going to get the production. And that's been hard to... So, so you've, you've got this th three-way push-pull thing. We've got... It's like a triangle. On one edge of the triangle, we've got oil and energy products, oil, gas, and coal. Then you've got money our ability to, to direct capital and what money is and its relationship between say the us dollar and oil sales on the third point you've got minerals because you require both of those other things to mine minerals and all three things together support our technology and our economics and i'm i'm, I'm building a model where when you have one of those three things you have the other two and you cannot actually separate them and so, yes, oil's in trouble. Okay. <laughs> so um, speaking about the triangle and how it's yep. interconnected, yep. we've got the fossil fuels uh, on, the, on the one end. We've got capital and, and the markets on the other corner. If we have a problem in energy, do we have a problem in capital markets where interest rates and all this stuff goes up and you can't fund the energy to drive what you're what you need to do in society. So I, I understand that they're interconnected. Uh, I could see how energy, if we fall short in energy, uh, let's say the decline rates uh, are greater than what we can add to the system. So we stay flat or go down uh, in oil. We have to grow our, our capital markets uh, we have to grow the debt because that's the design of the system. Interest rates go up uncontrollably. And now nobody can afford to basically bring on these projects of either minerals uh, or energy. Does this whole system kind of yep. self-implode at some point when you don't have enough energy to sustain the, the, the system? I think it's the better way to say it will eat itself. 
what, explosion or implosion is one scenario. Another one is it will cannibalize parts of itself and one day it'll eat something it shouldn't. So what, what do you mean it'll cannibalize itself? Like like well, what the, we saw, the rates are what kill kills the projects or or how does this kind of function at least in your view? So what we saw in 2005, <laughs> January 2005, there was a blowout in metal price in all the markers that the World Bank used to, to look at the World Bank, uh, the, the, the global economy, the, the health of the industrial global economy. And there was a blowout. That blowout in price, and it's, it's in all the metals, you, when, you, when you overlay them, put them together, put the system under such stress Right. Three years later, we had the global financial crisis where the weakest link broke. The proxy marker for the start of that was the price of oil peaking. And the proxy marker for when things turned around was when quantitative easing was then applied at such a phenomenal level that the price of oil stopped crashing and then it recovered. But since then, we still have that massive volatility in prices. So whatever that was, it was not resolved by a large economic crash and the volatility is still there. But the prob the, the fundamental problem is still there. The real problem, um, in 1972, the United States dollar decoupled from the gold standard and ended the Bretton Woods Agreement. And from that point, it was a fiat currency, which means now a fiat currency on its own would have been okay if the people administering that fiat currency played by their own rules but the reality is they didn't they broke their own rules from the beginning and so every time they had a problem they could just print more money and the first problem to come along was the 1973 oil embargo and that's when they just threw money at it and they fixed it and they oh this works and so for the for the last 50 odd years every time there's been a problem instead of actually sort of taking the, the economic pain and dealing with things in an, an appropriate reality-based context They've debased the currency. And so now we're in a situation where prior to 1972, uh, oil and GDP, oil production and GDP correlated perfectly. One overlaid the other uh, when you actually put them in the same starting point. After that diversion point, they started to move out. And there's now a 17 to 1 ratio between GDP and oil production. Now, GDP, they changed the rules as they do every now and then, and somewhere along the line, they've now included uh, financial assets like derivatives in GDP, because, you know, of course you can. Uh, and so so I, what I sort of say is the source of the problem is when the real economy diverged from the fiat or, or virtual economy. And, and so uh, we're living on hopes and dreams uh, that the future, Chris Martinson says this very well, we're banking on the fact that the future is going to be larger than the past to pay for the debt we've already got. Whereas the smart money is, the future is going to be smaller than the past because of our energy issues. And when those two trends meet, hilarity will ensue. Uh, so to answer your question, what's going on, the currency has been debased through our own inaction, our own inappropriate management and the more and more debt is now required to bring it online to actually it's, it's like the whole system has been trying to thermodynamically correct multiple times over the last couple of decades but every time it does we are intervening to make sure it doesn't because we don't want to actually deal with the pain of an economic depression but what that means yeah you know, that the phrase kicking the can down the road what does that actually mean is Every time the system wants to correct, and it's like a safety valve, it starts venting um, to the atmosphere, if you will. And, and will we stop in to plug up the gap? But in doing so, we've actually weakened the strength of our own currency. <laughs> so, and and the, the we've we've gotten away with it for so long because the United States dollar had the petrodollar agreement in 1973, where oil sales are actually purchased in US dollars. So the, the world was then required to interact with a fiat currency that they had no control over and they were just expanding because they could um, to maintain their own oil purchases, which was at the very heart of our industrial society, and it still is. And so, so we've been forced to actually use something we shouldn't. And now so, it's actually I mean starting to blow up. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just trying to piece this all together. So 
let, let's recap kind of what we've already gone over and kind of the okay. capital side of it real quick. We, everything that we've, that we're trying to implement renewable wise, electric vehicle wise, there's a lot of constraints, a lot of um, barriers to getting that done. Uh, mineral re like resource, just reserves in general, uh, the energy it takes to implement all this, our infrastructure is not set up for it, uh, on and on and on with that side. Then the yeah. things that are sustaining our society today, fossil fuels, we're having problems with those. They're starting to um, become less quality in terms of the density unreliable. of energy. Coming unreliable. Uh, yeah, and, and all that stuff on that, on that front. And then we've got capital markets that still want to grow at exponential paces of some percentage growth. Mm -hmm. Where Where's the pressure going to build here? Where is it going to mount? And what is this going to look like in your opinion? Uh, I know you've looked a lot at the energy transition and stuff like that. How How is, how are we going to handle this? What is it going to look like? And maybe what are some potential solutions that, that you've looked into? So I think the, the because our financial systems are virtual, we'll probably see them uh, flash off first. And what I'm just saying there is our ability to do fund transfers between banks, like the SWIFT system and all that, that might actually sort of become a problem where we can't operate things normally. So ability to do credit transfers and electronic fund transfers might, might be disrupted. But our ability to fix that, uh, because, you know, the... the uh, physical resources and the energy resources to which support everything else uh, will not be able to step up to fix that. So it, it's going to be like a, a couple of things interacting together, but we'll probably see it first in the money side of things. As the solutions, the nature of the problem is at a very, very fundamental level, the entire architecture of our old system and the entire architecture of what I call plan B, the green transition, is flawed. The structure is flawed. The foundation is flawed. So to fix it, it is, it's not just going to be like a new widget or a new app or you know, um, voting a new politician. That's not going to work. Right. The entire system needs to be redesigned from the grounding up, starting with two, two sources. What energy system do we use? What natural resources drive that energy system? What technology is used to access that energy system? And what natural resources are needed to make that technology? And at that level of things, things have to, to move. And then after those questions is, what monetary system would we use as a decision-making system to say who does what and who owns what? Right. So at a very, very fundamental level, um, we've got to... First, change where we get our energy from. And once we do that, how do we use it? So, so we used to sort of have a steam train to actually, uh, coal fired steam, steam trains to actually move bulk materials around. And, and in fact, the, some of those bulk materials was the energy, the coal itself. Um, then we had the idea of the internal combustion engine. So, transport needs to be reimagined. But will it look the same? Probably not. Right. And so, if we're actually sort of leaning towards the idea of, we need to actually sort of use electricity more effectively. At the moment, we are can, we are determined to use batteries in some form. So, all right, I suggest we will use batteries, but less of them, and we're going to make them out of something else, something that doesn't have resource constraints and something that can be made locally. So what has to happen is a few things. The whole financial system needs to be restructured into something that's actually genuinely or more appropriate, something that's you know, physical asset back, something that can be trusted and something that we can all sort of say, yes, we understand what's happening. Oh, so there are, there are a couple of discussions in that front. I don't think gold-backed currency will do the job. It has to be something else. Then um, we've got to reinvent how we do our transport. And then we've got to, uh, re you know, the, 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 the number of things that have to sort of happen at the same time. Uh Energy generation-wise, I'm now looking at a couple of solution vectors. One of them is deep geothermal, where if, if someone was to actually sort of a, a way of drilling very deep, very quickly and cheaply, and that they are looking at that, and I have seen one of these drills, then that might change things. 
there are massive logistical problems with that. So it's nowhere near ready. Uh, but if we got that going, that's an energy source. The one that is ready to go is actually from 50 years in our past. Um, I actually was in Hong Kong recently and I was presenting uh, to a group of capital investment groups and I spoke to a few people and they were telling me, this is something I'd already looked at, but they, they confirmed this exists. Out in the Gobi Desert, they've actually got a liquid fuel fission operation using thorium as the fuel. And it's about two mega, it's a two megawatt system. So it's a modular system and it's now selling power commercially. Right. So the implications are this solid fuel nuclear is very complicated and it's very expensive and it's very, very tricky. And you need people who know what they're doing to handle everything. And because it takes such a long time to build nuclear power plants, like you know, it can be 30 years. Uh, they're not going to be able to expand fast enough. Even if we dropped it down to five years, we still can't expand fast enough for conventional nuclear to be the energy source. Right. So, and, and also you've got the architecture of you've got a massive power plant and you've got a massive power grid going out to applications. Uh, like in, in Thomas Edison's day, he had a DC-based electrical power plant on every block, every every like uh, city block, there was a big power station. And then Nikola Tesla comes along and invents AC, AC power, and which means you could push power a long way and you didn't need all that infrastructure. That's the kind of change we need to see here. So solid fuel nuclear um, has its problems. We, let's say we've got a fuel rod and the fuel is in spheres and balls in that, in that rod. As it's a, a radiated and is actually releasing heat through that radiation, the stuff on the surface can operate, but the stuff in the center is trapped by the stuff on the surface. So at some point, you've got to take the fuel out because it doesn't it doesn't sustain the reaction anymore. So this is uh, um, conventional uranium needs a isotope called U two three five to sustain the reaction. That in natural uranium is about 0.7 percent of natural uranium. We put it through what's called enrichment, and we can enrich it up to about four percent. So when we make aluminium fuel rods, only about 4% of their mass is actually useful to us. And the rest is uranium-238. That's the stuff they make bombs out of. But it's not a useful isotope to maintain the actual chain reaction. So when they actually use up that 4% and they take the rod out, it is still full of uranium, but it's the wrong isotope. And that's why it's so radioactive and hot and you've got to do things with it, like under you know, power-cooled storage. And, and, and it's very complicated. And if you get it wrong, lots of people get hurt. Liquid fuel is a different proposition. So it can be like liquid metal, for example. Liquid metal reactors are another version of this. But let, let's say we go back to thorium. Uh, but liquid fuel also works with uranium. Make a salt. Let's say uranium salt. Make a salt. Bombard it with neutrons to the point where we can get the reaction going. The reaction heats up. The salt melts into a fluid. That fluid goes around the reactor and interacts with another vessel that exchanges heat that heat generates electricity because that salt that now liquid is can move to all other parts of the circuit all fuel comes in contact with all other fuel it's not trapped and so you don't need to actually take it out and recycle it so it can it uh now uranium salt can be used there are various metals that can be used in this uh, context as well the, the one i'm finding very interesting is thorium a combination of thorium and fluoride salt. Thorium, because it's not radioactive to start with. If you go to a uranium mine, it's radioactive. Uh, the, 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 the ore is slightly radioactive. The yellow cake you make is you have to handle it accordingly. With thorium salt, is what's called a fertile material, and it only uh, it's got a background radiation, a little bit of a background, but not enough to have a classification. So it's much safer to handle. Now, also because of thorium the way it is, all the fuel that you put in the reactor is useful. Well, well about 4 or 5% doesn't get burned because it's other isotopes. So for, for conventional nuclear, you put in, say, um, a, a, a watt of fuel, 96% comes out as not useful, and you've got to do something with it. With the thorium liquid fission stuff, only 4 or 5% comes out, so it's a much smaller mass, and you're using all of it going in. Right, so the footprint of this system is so small. And what's also interesting is you don't need water to cool a liquid system down, which is why it operates out in the desert, in the Gobi Desert in China. Now, 
this what I'm referring to here is this is a system that operates to very different rules to conventional nuclear. And if it can be applied, if you can make small scale units and you can make them safely, every industrial unit could have a small scale power source under it, like a two megawatt um, power plant would actually run a small town you know, of the civilian population, or it could run a smelter, or it could run you know, a hospital. And so, so if you actually did that and you had a reactor under every action that we needed, that does two things. First of all, it would cut out the need for a massive transport grid, you know, the, you know, the grid between everything. That, that's a lot of resources and lots, a lot of money to maintain. Second thing it would do is it would knock out the need for a buffer. You know, this is the problem with wind and solar. And the materials to make these reactors, you, you, need, you need a lot of nickel. Right, but you don't, but you don't need in other exotic, uh, as many exotic materials. And so, the vast majority of our material requirements would shift dramatically um, if we use this idea in conjunction with contracting our system down in size. You know, uh, if we contracted the just-in-time supply grid from six-continent monstrosity system we've got into a single city. Right by doing things like three D printing of manufacturing, and extracting commodities to make three D printing feedstock, that changes the rules for almost everything. Right, uh, yeah, and, and so so the, these changes, even though I'm, they're, they're, they're uh, only a few of them, have the capacity to radically reduce our material requirements, especially if we are prepared to simplify our requirements down as a society. You, instead of having things so complex, make them simpler so we can actually produce them ourselves and, and design them to be recycled. Therefore, we can have a recycling loop, whereas at the moment we can't. So this is the kind of solution space. And, and at the heart of all of it is, is how we think and what, what, what choices do we make as a society. And that's actually the solution space I'm moving into now. 3D printing is awesome. You'll also have a lot less waste than machining and, yeah. and all that other stuff. Oh, and and so, you, with something else, and then on it goes. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the way we'll we'll get to Mars and all that because we'll just keep a bunch of material and print the design and use that part. Oh. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, so coming from the current state of where we're at today to a potential future state, yeah, uh, it's going to look pretty messy, isn't it? <laughs> we're going to go through a lot of crap. Yeah, so the real problem there is actually not the technology, it's actually us, right? Um, how many times have you come across this phenomenon where people point blank refuse to acknowledge these issues, let alone have a discussion about what we might do about them, right? So we've got 8 billion people on the planet, but how many of those people are prepared to engage with these issues? The answer is very few. And because it takes time to do these things, uh, and we're running out of time. In fact, we have run out of time. So whatever happens next, it's not going to happen cleanly for 8 billion people, but it might happen for a small number of people. Like uh, uh, The future's here, but it's non-linear. It's, it's unevenly distributed. Some regions will do okay, some won't, and so they'll have to have some other problem solving to get through. It's going to be one hell of a mess. And so what, so what I can still see happening is little pockets of innovation will start up, in ways that we haven't thought of yet that will use things differently they will prosper and especially people who can think flexibly and who can actually see things differently with what's around them now they will that they will do okay there'll be large proportions of the population that could have solutions around them but refuse to engage and that they insist on doing things the way they are now so they're going to sort of you know they're going to deal with all the problems that we can sort of see coming and so it's going to be a big old mess, but there's going to be parts of human society that could pull a phoenix maneuver where others won't. And those groups that do, then they'll sort of start to hook up and they'll prosper. Do you think as we transition through this, can our, can, I mean, the way that I kind of view this is uh, our, our currency systems and the way they're designed need growth. If we don't get that growth and we, we have to transition through a no growth or negative growth period, 
our, our currency is going to blow up in our face as we're trying to do this transition and kind of just yep. destroy this whole progress that we that we need to make or this this next level that we need to jump to uh, or next thing. Could that be one thing that just dis- kind of destroys everything? Or do you think that's not really a, a, a big deal? Oh, it is a big deal. Uh, it is a big deal and it has the capacity to really sort of harm any sort of solution space. Uh, we have to look at what money is. And what does it do for us? So at a fundamental level, the existing finance system has to grow. And it's been that way since we took on fractional reserve banking and the formation of the Federal Reserve back in 1930. And it's been going on so long that we think that this is normal. If we look at money in terms of it's a decision-making system that helps us decide who does what and who owns what, can we do that some other way? Right now, uh, so some of the cryptocurrencies that come out are very interesting because they're not just money. Each one of them is an application in its own right. Like, like uh, they, they, they do something useful and their money. And so that that's something I'm still trying to get my head around what I'm seeing there. But um, then we've got to have the idea of, you know, the, the reason every social contract so far, you know, capitalism, communism, fascism, even feudalism, they're all based on growth in some form. Every ism that we know, and and without growth, they will fail. Uh, and all, all attempts to actually um, reach this have, ha- haven't worked out so far, because we've failed to understand the human being, on one hand, must collaborate together in groups where we work together. At the same time, every individual must feel that they have actually um, have control of their own destiny and can innovate. They, they actually have control over what happens to them and their family. And that dual purpose has not been reached yet. And we've got to answer that question before we actually go to what should money actually be? And that's a tough ask to do in one step. I, I would suggest we would see multiple different currencies of different kinds, and you'll have a wild, wild west of transfer between the different types. And, and and so you think it's hard to be doing business now. <laughs> <laughs> and one last question here, it uh, deals with if one's going to ride through this, because I, I, I know I do, we have a lot of finance and stuff like that. How does one protect their wealth through this transition, in your opinion? How, how, how do you get from where we are today to this current future state without getting slaughtered uh, between it, in so, your opinion? That's that's a difficult question because people have been game theorying this for decades. And so any place that looks like it might be valuable, um, let's say you go the traditional gold bug, uh, you know, I'm now going to have uh, a vault full of gold, right? You're now vulnerable because someone could come and take that gold, especially if they happen to find you on a list somewhere. Uh, but then once you've got that gold, what do you do with it? How do you sell it? How do you use it? How do you transfer yourself back into wealth through that? I think any any way of storing wealth that can be taken off you, whether it's in a bank account or in a safe, um, serves a purpose, but you shouldn't depend upon it. My understanding of all that is knowledge and the ability to be flexible to make something valuable. Now, what that means is it's going to be very difficult to store millions and billions of dollars of wealth right and to to do that i don't know any good answers to that um you you might do things like diversify um i i wouldn't give financial advice on on to where people should park their money what i would suggest is the long-term um sovereignty of their family depends on what value you can actually give to the people around you and the community around you like how useful are you In, in this environment what can you deliver? Or are you a person that's just going to sit there and consume resources and expect everyone else to do the work for you? Um, I don't really have a good answer for you, is what I'm just saying there. But my personal approach is to accept the fact that um, anything that's in a bank account is vulnerable because it's virtual. Um, but anything that's physical is going to be very hard to trade in a useful way for some time. So, and so now it's actually set about, can you actually take part in building something new, but be flexible where you can transfer from one system to another. 
And when you sort of see a storm cloud coming, or if you can't spread yourself into different systems, move. Don't be in one. Yeah, so so if, even if I could provide value to, to a system, how would that value, how, how do I get compensated for that value? Um, it's almost like you're describing like a barter system to some extent. Um, I'm, or... I'm, I'm sort of describing a, a network of different currencies where some currencies are okay and some are not. But on any given day, that changes, right? So, so um, let, 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 one day you get paid in US dollars. Next day you get paid in I don't know Chinese yuan, or and the next day you get paid in silver coins, right? But but they don't hold their value for very long, right? Right, and so you're at the center of all of it, interacting with all systems. Right, so there's no one system that will survive long term. You've got to actually sort of read the tea leaves and sort of see how things are going and have the flexibility to jump between systems that I think might work. And so that's not, it's not so much a barter system. That's uh, um, it, it's like you're surfing the stock market and you've got stocks, but the stock marks are being slaughtered and having a boom. There's a, bo there's a, there's a bull boom and a bear bust happening at the same time, but there's swapping hats. Who does what? Right. And so if you can navigate that system and be flexible to move very quickly and accept losses, losses happen, you know, you know, don't try not to worry too much and opportunities will happen. Great. Grab them when you can. It's just going to be an inherently unstable environment we're moving into. Uh, and is there any questions I hadn't asked uh, that I should be asking or anything else that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah. Before yeah. Yep. This is a personal observation of mine. Uh, the bottleneck we're facing most of all is the current way of thinking. We at the moment, have, we've seen these problems for a long time, but what's really sort of stopping us from engaging with these things is the established attitudes to a lot of these things. Like if you try and sort of talk about any of these problems, especially 10, 20 years ago, as a stop talking to me. Human innovation is an amazing thing. Someone will think of something. Now, that is true. But what they're really saying is, you're making me uncomfortable, stop talking. Because those that wording is being used to shut down any discussion at all about these issues. And, and so instead of actually saying, this is a problem, now let's move on to solution, I don't want to acknowledge the existence of that. So human human innovation is an amazing thing. Sure, so is denial. And if we don't actually work on a problem, then we don't get the solution. So it requires us to, instead of actually, and, and there's also like a, um, an almost uh, an attitude where um, a, a large portion of humanity thinks that humanity should be punished for its past uh, misdeeds, which, which has the net effect of anyone who's trying to actually sort of do something about this where, where we can sort of get through this, you know, semi-intact, that gets shut down. So a lot of our attitudes really aren't helping into actually sort of, who, who do we work with? How do we work with? Like, how do we interact together? Um, how do we, um, it, we're not in a world, for example, where everyone accepts everyone else's opinion, live and let live. Freedom of speech, for example, freedom of thought. That's not good enough. If you see someone who has a different opinion to you, you're conditioned to hunt them down and destroy their opinions. And if you can't do that, at some level, you think your opinions are wrong. Right? That, that mentality is not helpful for us. So what I would just say is we've got to get past all that and, as a society, develop a different way of how we see these things, including problems and solutions, and each other. Is the person next to you your enemy, or are they your solution? Yeah. <laughs> and, if, and if they're your enemy, does that mean... Um, your ability to problem solve now is that you're in a fight for survival. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's it doesn't have to be this way at all. And the longer we take to actually get to that point, the harder things are going to be. And here's a, another question, just spurred off that: How does AI fit into this? Is artificial intelligence going to help us solve maybe this transition or problem? It depends on how we use it. Uh, Dmitry Orlov wrote a very interesting book called Shrinking the Technosphere. And he asked a very basic question. Do we, does the technosphere, the technology net, does it serve us or do we serve it? 
So, so AI, when it comes in, is a technology. So we've got to learn it and use it, but not be overrun by it. I see AI as a very sophisticated version of Google search, where it looks at um, a lot of information, it'll interrogate it, and then, you, and then you can actually sort of work with it. It is very vulnerable for garbage in and garbage out. So you've got to use it in some contexts and everything, but you've got to be the strongest link in the chain, not the weakest. You can't just take it for granted that what it's talking about. Also, um, you really shouldn't be using it to write anything because there'll come a point when it'll be apparent there'll be tools to determine whether you have used AI or not. And so you're damaging your professional career if you depend on it for that. What you could do, though, is a planning tool. What are my options? And so the trick is when you use it, you use it in a stage fashion where you ask one question and you ask another contextual question and then another contextual question, and you're slowly honing in on the answer. And then, the, then there's the sniff test. Am I being fed? Um, is, is garbage in, garbage out? So is it sensible? True innovation and creativity is still required by a human being because that um, the AI cannot engage in something that's not already written down. And that's that's where that's where we're at at the moment. So yes, AI will be useful as long as we use it the correct way. That's all I've got for today. Anything else you'd like okay. to share? Uh, <laughs> yes, things are moving into, you know, I, I presented my work um, many, many times now over the last couple of years, and it's really sort of told me what needs to happen, right? Uh, how do we get out of this? Is it the, um, it's told me who's going to do it, who's not going to do it, and where it's going to happen. So my solution going forward, I'm going to pull a series of ideas together on two major fronts need surgery. One is our the waste plume coming off our industry systems in terms of environmental impact. The other is our agricultural systems as they interact with the planetary environment. Those two sectors need surgery. I don't agree with any of the solutions that are on, on the books at the moment though. I want to, for example, take elements of things like, uh, I, I would like to go and um, develop a society that does two jobs. First, looks at unorthodox ideas to develop a new energy paradigm. And there are many, many unorthodox ideas out there. And we can put them all together. The second job is can we merge with the natural environment in a more sensible, symbiotic fashion? This is our agriculture. So we're talking permaculture. We're talking regenerative agriculture, all that stuff. Reinvent transport, reinvent energy, reinvent manufacture. And when I say reinvent, we're just applying ideas we've already got. And there's there's lots of them. They're all around us. And the other thing too is the basic idea of degrowth, you know, that the Club of Rome sort of put out is in, is fundamentally useful. So instead of actually doing things a particular way where we're consuming resources like locusts, do things in a different way where the loop, the final loop associated with our manufacture is much, much smaller. And so the human society can contract in footprint. In terms of in terms of environmental impact, but also in what we do and how we do it, where we get our commodities from, what do we do with them once we have them, what do we do when we finish with them, are we ever finished with them? Those ideas all need to be put together into one place. Now I'm putting together a plan, and my next professional step will be to engage in that, and I encourage others to do something similar. Okay, and if somebody wants to follow your work, how do they do it? Okay, I'm going to type my website. Do you have my website? We can okay. we can put it in the description link below. Yeah, yeah. So yep. everything I do, well, not not everything actually, but um, as much as much as I can actually sort of get together goes onto my website, Simon SimonMichaud.com. Yeah, I'll That's put that in the description link. Yep. Hang on. So, yeah. So let me make sure I get the right one there because it, that looks like a comma, not a full stop. Anyway. So yeah, there it is. Here it comes. So that's the, the second one that's there. Use that. All right. So that's, that's how they can sort of find me and they can contact me if they need. Um, yeah. We'll put that in the description link. All right. Well, that's all I've got for questions today, guys. Thank you for coming on Simon. Really appreciate it. And uh, okay. we'll catch everyone later. See you guys.